domain. The White Seal, Part One. Oh, hush thee, my baby, the night is behind us, and black are the waters that sparkle so green. The moon, o'er the combers, looks downward to find us, at rest in the hollows that rustle between. Where billow meets billow, then soft be thy pillow, ah, weary we flipperling, curl at thy ease. The storm shall not wake thee, nor shark overtake thee, asleep in the arms of the slow-swinging seas. Seal Lullaby All these things happened several years ago, at a place called Novastashan, or Northeast Point, on the island of St. Paul, away and away in the Bering Sea. Lemershin, the winter wren, told me the tale when he was blown on the rigging of a steamer going to Japan, and I took him down to my cabin and warmed and fed him for several days till he was fit to fly back to St. Paul's again. Lemershin is a very quaint little bird, but he knows how to tell the truth. Nobody comes to Novastashan except on business, and the only people who have regular business there are the seals. They come in the summer months by hundreds and hundreds of thousands out of the cold gray sea, for Novastashan Beach has the finest accommodation for seals of any place in all the world. Sea Catch knew that and every spring would swim from whatever place he happened to be in, would swim like a torpedo-boat straight for Novastashan, and spend a month fighting with his companions for a good place on the rocks, as close to the sea as possible. Sea Catch was fifteen years old, a huge gray fur seal with almost a mane on his shoulders, and long wicked dog-teeth. When he heaved himself up on his front flippers, he stood more than four feet clear of the ground, and his weight, if any one had been bold enough to weigh him, was nearly seven hundred pounds. He was scarred all over with the marks of savage fights, but he was always ready for just one fight more. He would put his head on one side, as though he were afraid to look his enemy in the face. Then he would shoot it out like lightning, and when the big teeth were firmly fixed on the other seal's neck, the other seal might get away if he could, but Sea Catch would not help him. Yet Sea Catch never chased a beaten seal, for that was against the rules of the beach. He only wanted room by the sea for his nursery. But as there were forty or fifty thousand other seals hunting for the same thing each spring, the whistling, bellowing, roaring, and blowing on the beach was something frightful. From a little hill called Hutchinson's Hill you could look over three and a half miles of ground covered with fighting seals. The surf was dotted all over with the heads of seals hurrying to land and begin their share of the fighting. They fought in the breakers, they fought in the sand, and they fought on the smooth-worn basalt rocks of the nurseries, for they were just as stupid and unaccommodating as men. Their wives never came to the island until late in May or early in June, for they did not care to be torn to pieces, and the young two-, three-, and four-year-old seals who had not begun housekeeping, went inland about half a mile through the ranks of the fighters, and played about on the sand dunes in droves and legions, and rubbed off every single green thing that grew. They were called Hollis Chicky, the Bachelors, and there were perhaps two or three hundred thousand of them at Novastashan alone. Sea Catch had just finished his forty-fifth fight one spring when Matka, his soft, sleek, gentle-eyed wife, came up out of the sea, and he caught her by the scruff of the neck, and dumped her down on his reservation, saying gruffly, Late as usual, where have you been? It was not the fashion for Sea Catch to eat anything during the four months he stayed on the beaches and so his temper was generally bad. Matka knew better than to answer back. She looked round and cooed, How thoughtful of you! You've taken the old place again. 
I should think I had, said Sea Catch. Look at me. He was scratched and bleeding in twenty places. One eye was almost out, and his sides were torn to ribbons. Oh, you men, you men, Matka said, fanning herself with her hind flipper. Why can't you be sensible and settle your places quietly? You look as though you had been fighting with the killer whale. I haven't been doing anything but fight since the middle of May. The beach is disgracefully crowded this season. I've met at least a hundred seals from Lucanon Beach, house hunting. Why can't people stay where they belong? I've often thought we should be much happier if we hauled out at Otter Island, instead of this crowded place, said Matka. Bah! Only the Hollis Chickie go to Otter Island? If we went there they would say we were afraid. We must preserve appearances, my dear. Sea Catch sunk his head proudly between his fat shoulders and pretended to go to sleep for a few minutes, but all the time he was keeping a sharp lookout for a fight. Now that all the seals and their wives were on the land, you could hear their clamor miles out to sea above the loudest gales. At the lowest counting there were over a million seals on the beach, old seals, mother seals, tiny babies, and hollis chicky, fighting, scuffling, bleeding, crawling, and playing together, going down to the sea and coming up from it in gangs and regiments, lying over every foot of ground as far as the eye could reach, and skirmishing about in brigades through the fog. It was nearly always foggy at Novastashan, except when the sun comes out and makes everything look all pearly and rainbow-colored for a little while. Kotick, Matka's baby, was born in the middle of that confusion, and he was all head and shoulders, with pale watery blue eyes, as tiny seals must be, but there was something about his coat that made his mother look at him very closely. See, Catch, she said at last, our baby's going to be white. Empty clams and dry seaweed, snorted Sea Catch. There never has been such a thing in the world as a white seal. I can't help that, said Matka. There's going to be now. And she sang the low crooning seal song that all the mother seals sing to their babies. You mustn't swim till you're six weeks old, or your head will be sunk by your heels, and summer gales and killer whales are bad for baby seals, are bad for baby seals, dear rat, as bad as bad can be. But splash and grow strong, and you can't be wrong, child of the open sea. Of course the little fellow did not understand the words at first. He paddled and scrambled about by his mother's side, and learned to scuffle out of the way when his father was fighting with another seal, and the two rolled and roared up and down the slippery rocks. Matka used to go to sea to get things to eat, and the baby was fed only once in two days, but then he ate all he could and throve upon it. The first thing he did was to crawl inland, and there he met tens of thousands of babies of his own age, and they played together like puppies, went to sleep on the clean sand, and played again. The old people in the nurseries took no notice of them, and the Hollis Chickie kept to their own grounds, and the babies had a beautiful playtime. When Matka came back from her deep-sea fishing, she would go straight to their playground and call as a sheep calls for a lamb, and wait until she heard Kotick bleat. Then she would take the straightest of straight lines in his direction, striking out with her four flippers and knocking the youngster's head over heels right and left. There were always a few hundred mothers hunting for their children through the playgrounds, and the babies were kept lively. But, as Matka told Kotick, so long as you don't lie in muddy water and get mange, or rub the hard sand into a cut or scratch, and so long as you never go swimming when there is a heavy sea, nothing will hurt you here. 
Little seals can no more swim than little children, but they are unhappy till they learn. The first time that Kotick went down to the sea, a wave carried him out beyond his depth, and his big head sank, and his little hind flippers flew up, exactly as his mother had told him in the song, and if the next wave had not thrown him back again, he would have drowned. After that he learned to lie in a beach pool, and let the wash of the waves just cover him, and lift him up while he paddled, but he always kept his eye open for big waves that might hurt. He was two weeks learning to use his flippers, and all that while he floundered in and out of the water, and coughed and grunted and crawled up the beach, and took cat naps on the sand, and went back again, until at last he found that he truly belonged to the water. Then you can imagine the times that he had with his companions, ducking under the rollers, or coming in on top of a comber and landing with a swash and a splutter as the big wave went whirling far up the beach, or standing up on his tail and scratching his head as the old people did, or playing, I'm the king of the castle, on slippery, weedy rocks that just stuck out of the wash. Now and then he would see a thin fin, like a big shark's fin, drifting along close to shore, and he knew that that was the killer whale, the Grampus, who eats young seals when he can get them, and Kotick would head for the beach like an arrow, and the fin would jig off slowly, as if it were looking for nothing at all. Late in October the seals began to leave St. Paul's for the deep sea, by families and tribes, and there was no more fighting over the nurseries, and the Hollis Chickie played anywhere they liked. Next year, said Makka to Kotick, you will be a Hollis Chickie, but this year you must learn how to catch fish. They set out together across the Pacific, and Matka showed Kotick how to sleep on his back, with his flippers tucked down by his side, and his little nose just out of the water. No cradle is so comfortable as the long rocking swell of the Pacific. When Kotick felt his skin tingle all over, Matka told him he was learning the feel of the water, and that tingly prickly feelings meant bad weather coming, and he must swim hard and get away. In a little time, she said, you'll know where to swim to, but just now we'll follow Sea Pig, the porpoise, for he is very wise. A school of porpoises were ducking and tearing through the water, and little Kotick followed them as fast as he could. How do you know where to go to? he panted. The leader of the school rolled his white eye and ducked under. My tail tingles, youngster, he said. That means there's a gale behind me. Come along. When you're south of the sticky water, he meant the equator, and your tail tingles. That means there's a gale in front of you, and you must head north. Come along. The water feels bad here. This was one of the very many things that Kotick learned, and he was always learning. Matka taught him to follow the cod and the halibut along the undersea banks, and wrench the rockling out of his hold among the weeds, how to skirt the wrecks laying a hundred fathoms below water, and dart like a rifle bullet in at one porthole and out at another as the fishes ran, how to dance on the top of the waves when the lightning was racing all over the sky, and wave his flipper politely to the stumpy-tailed albatross and the man-of-war hawk as they went down the wind, how to jump three or four feet clear of the water like a dolphin, flippers close to the side and tail curved, to leave the flying fish alone because they are all bony. To take the shoulder piece out of a cod at full speed ten fathoms deep, and never to stop and look at a boat or a ship, but particularly a rowboat. At the end of six months, what Kotick did not know about deep sea fishing was not worth knowing. At all that time he never set flipper on dry land. One day, however, 
as he was lying half asleep in the warm water somewhere off the island of Juan Fernandez, he felt faint and lazy all over, just as humans do when the spring is in their legs. And he remembered the good firm beaches of Navastashan seven thousand miles away, the games his companions played, the smell of the seaweed, the seal roar, and the fighting. That very minute he turned north, swimming steadily, and as he went on he met scores of his mates, all bound for the same place. And they said, Greeting, Kotick. This year we are all holoschicky, and we can dance the fire dance in the breakers off Lucanon and play on the new grass. But where did you get that coat? Kotick's fur was almost pure white now, and though he felt very proud of it, he only said, Swim quickly, my bones are aching for the land. And so they all came to the beaches where they had been born, and heard the old seals, their fathers, fighting in the rolling mist. That night Kotick danced the fire dance with the yearling seals. The sea is full of fire on summer nights, all the way down from Novastishana to Lucanon, and each seal leaves a wake like burning oil behind him, and a flaming flash when he jumps and the waves break in great phosphorescent streaks and swirls. Then they went inland to the hollis chicky grounds, and rolled up and down in the new wild wheat, and told stories of what they had done while they had been at sea. They talked about the Pacific, as boys would talk about a wood that they had been nutting in, and if any one had understood them, he could have gone away and made such a chart of that ocean as never was. The three and four year old Hollis Chicky romped down from Hutchinson's Hill, crying, Out of the way, youngsters! The sea is deep, and you don't know all that's in it yet. Wait till you've rounded the horn. Hi, you yearling, where did you get that white coat? I didn't get it, said Kotick. It grew. And just as he was going to roll the speaker over, a couple of black-haired men with flat red faces came from behind the sand dune, and Kotick, who had never seen a man before, coughed and lowered his head. The holus chicky just bundled off a few yards and sat staring stupidly. The men were no less than Carrick Buterin, the chief of the seal-hunters on the island, and Pantalamon his son. They came from the little village not half a mile from the sea nurseries, and they were deciding what seals they would drive up to the killing pens, for the seals were driven, just like sheep, to be turned into seal-skin jackets later on. Ho! Oh, said Pantalamon. Look, there's a white seal. Carrick Buterin turned nearly white under his oil and spoke, for he was an Aleut, and Aleuts are not clean people. Then he began to mutter a prayer. Don't touch him, Pantalamon. There has never been a white seal since, since I was born. Perhaps it's old Zaharoth's ghost. He was lost last year in the big gale. I'm not going near him, said Pantalamon. He's unlucky. Do you really think he is old Zaharoth come back? I owe him some gull's eggs. Don't look at him, said Carrick. Head off that drove of four-year-olds. The men ought to skin two hundred today, but it's the beginning of the season, and they are new to the work. A hundred will do. Quick. Pantalamon rattled a pair of seal's shoulder bones in front of a herd of hollis chicky, and they stopped dead, puffing and blowing. Then he stepped near, and the seals began to move and Carrick headed them inland, and they never tried to get back to their companions. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of seals watched them being driven, but they went on playing just the same. Kotick was the only one who asked questions, and none of his companions could tell him anything, except that the men always drove seals in that way for six weeks or two months of every year. "'I am going to follow.' he said, and his eyes nearly popped out of his head as he shuffled along in the wake of the herd. "'The white seal is coming after us!' 
cried Pantalamon. That's the first time a seal has ever come to the killing grounds alone. Hush! Don't look behind you, said Carrick. It is Sarahoff's ghost. I must speak to the priest about this. The distance to the killing grounds was only half a mile, but it took an hour to cover, because if the seals went too fast, Herrick knew that they would get heated, and then their fur would come off in patches when they were skinned. So they went on very slowly, past Sea Lion's Neck, past Webster House, till they came to the Salt House just beyond the sight of the seals on the beach. Kotick followed, panting and wondering. He thought that he was at the world's end, but the roar of the sea nurseries behind him sounded as loud as the roar of a train in a tunnel. Then Carrick sat down on the moss and pulled out a heavy pewter watch and let the drove cool off for thirty minutes. And Kotick could hear the fog dew dripping off the brim of his cap. Then ten or twelve men, each with an iron-bound club three or four feet long, came up, and Carrick pointed out one or two of the drove that were bitten by their companions, or too hot, and the men kicked those aside with their heavy boots made of the skin of a walrus's throat. And then Carrick said, Let's go. Then the men clubbed the seals on the head as fast as they could. Ten minutes later, Little Kotick did not recognize his friends any more, for their skins were ripped off from the nose to the hind flippers, whipped off and thrown down on the ground in a pile. That was enough for Kotick. He turned and galloped, a seal can gallop very swiftly for a short time, back to the sea, his little new mustache bristling with horror. At Sea Lion's Neck, where the great sea lions sit on the edge of the surf, he flung himself flipper overhead into the cool water and rocked there, gasping miserably. "'What's here?' said a sea lion gruffly. For as a rule the sea lions keep themselves to themselves. "'Scoochin! Oak and scoochin! I'm lonesome, very lonesome,' said Kotick. They're killing all the hullus chicky on all the beaches. The sea lion turned his head inshore. Nonsense, he said. Your friends are making as much noise as ever. You must have seen old Carrick polishing off a drove. He's done that for thirty years. It's horrible, said Kotick, backing water as a wave went over him and steadying himself with a screw stroke of his flippers that brought him all standing within three inches of a jagged edge of a rock. "'Well done for a yearling,' said the sea lion, who could appreciate good swimming. "'I suppose it is rather awful from your way of looking at it. But if you seals will come here year after year, of course the men will get to know of it. And unless you can find an island where no men ever come, you will always be driven. Isn't there any such island? asked Kotick. I followed the pole twos, the halibut, for twenty years, and I can't say I have found it yet. But look here, you seem to have a fondness for talking to your betters. Suppose you go to the walrus islet and talk to Seavich. He may know something. Don't flounce off like that. It's a six-mile swim, and if I were you I should haul out and take a nap first, little one." Kotick thought that that was good advice, so he swam round to his own beach, hauled out, and slept for half an hour, twitching all over his seal's will. Then he headed straight for Walrus Islet, a little low sheet of rocky island almost due northeast from Novastashan all ledges and rock and gull's nests, where the walrus herded by themselves. He landed close to old Seavich, the big, ugly, bloated, pimpled, fat-necked, long-tusked walrus of the North Pacific, who has no manners except when he is asleep, as he was then, with his hind flippers half in and half out of the surf. Wake up! barked Kotick, for the gulls were making a great noise. Huh? Oh, hmm. What's that? said Seavich, 
and he struck the next walrus a blow with his tusks and waked him up, and the next struck the next and so on, till they were all awake and staring in every direction but the right one. "'Hi, it's me,' said Kotick, bobbing in the surf and looking like a little white slug. "'Well, may I be skinned?' said Seavich, and they all looked at Kotick, as you can fancy a club full of drowsy old gentlemen would look at a little boy. Kotick did not care to hear any more about skinning just then. He had seen enough of it. So he called out, Isn't there any place for seals to go where men don't ever come? Go and find out, said Seavich, shutting his eyes. Run away. We're busy here. Kotick made his dolphin jump in the air, and shouted as loud as he could, "'Clam-eater! Clam-eater!' He knew that Seavich never caught a fish in his life, but always rooted for clams and seaweed, though he pretended to be a very terrible person. Naturally, the Chickies and the Gooverooskies and the Epitaks, the Burgomaster Gulls and the Kittywakes and the Puffins, who were always looking for a chance to be rude, took up the cry, and, so Lemmershin told me, for nearly five minutes you could not have heard a gun fired on Walrus Islet. All the population was yelling and screaming, Clam-eater! Star-eek! Old man! While Seavich rolled from side to side, grunting and coughing. Now will you tell? said Kotick, all out of breath. "'Go and ask Seekow,' said Seavich. "'If he is living still, he'll be able to tell you.' "'How shall I know Seekow when I meet him?' said Kotick, shearing off. "'He's the only thing in the sea uglier than Seavich,' screamed a burgomaster gull, wheeling under Seavich's nose. "'Uglier, and with worse manners. Stareek! Kotick swam back to Novostishan, leaving the gulls to scream. There he found that no one sympathized with him in his little attempt to discover a quiet place for the seals. They told him that men had always driven the Hollis Chicky, it was part of the day's work, and that if he did not like to see ugly things, he should not have gone to the killing grounds. But none of the other seals had seen the killing, and that made the difference between him and his friends. Besides, Kotick was a white seal. "'What you must do,' said old Sea Catch, after he had heard his son's adventures, "'is to grow up and be a big seal like your father, and have a nursery on the beach, and then they will leave you alone. In another five years you ought to be able to fight for yourself.' Even gentle Matka, his mother, said, "'You will never be able to stop the killing.' Go and play in the sea, Kotick. And Kotick went off and danced the fire dance with a very heavy little heart. End of Part One of The White Seal